In December of 1997, Sendent was the result of a $14 billion merger between HFS and Coop. This is a case where a legitimate company, HFS, merges with an unethical company, Coop, and how the results are staggering losses for stakeholders. Coop had created a meet-the-numbers scheme that involved fraudulent income smoothing practices. Since it's not completely defined by GAAP as to where a cutoff point is, management's judgment is exercised over the discretion of materiality. This inadvertently allows wiggle room for management's discretions which ultimately affect earnings quality. Until its exposure in 1998, certain members of Cook's senior and middle management devised and operated a systemic, systematic scheme to inflate operating income at both Cook and Sendant. The typical case of earnings manipulation begins with the track record of success. Cook's senior management's aggressive financial accounting techniques were driven by their scheme to always meet financial results anticipated by Wall Street analysts. The numbers game became the culture of Cook and carried on into Sendent's day-to-day operations. Analysis of Sendent's earnings management show that management manipulated recognition of the company's membership sales revenues by not recording membership cancellations. Shenanigans number four is the shifting of current expenses such as membership cancellations to a later period, as in this case. Management improperly utilized two liability accounts related to membership sales. Consistently maintaining inadequate balances in the accounts and on occasion reversing the accounts directly into operating income. To hide the inadequate balances, management periodically kept certain membership sales transactions off the books. Failing to record or improperly reducing liabilities is shenanigan number five. And what was the most significant category quantitatively, Cook management intentionally overstated merger and purchase reserves only to subsequently reverse the reserves directly into operating expenses and revenue. Management also wrote off assets, including assets that were unimpaired, and improperly charged the write-offs against the company's merger reserves. Then proper write-offs inflated operating income in various ways, leading to shenanigan number seven of shifting future expenses to current periods as a special charge. Red flags that should have been followed up by auditors were the reductions in reserves, frequent acquisitions of businesses, not reserving for possible future losses, reduction in discretionary costs at year end, change in members of top management and changing in accounting principles. Income smoothing is an accounting technique used to smooth out net income fluctuations from one period to the next. It is also known as earnings management. Income smoothing does not rely on creative accounting or misstatements which would constitute outright fraud, but rather on the latitude and flexibility provided in the interpretation of GAAP. Managers participate in income smoothing practices because investors are generally willing to pay a premium for stocks with steady and predictable earnings streams compared with stocks whose earnings are subject to wild fluctuations. Most senior management's bonuses and compensations are also performance-based. Problems arise when ethical lines are blurred to suit management's interests as opposed to public's interests due to leeway provided within GAAP. Management rationalized their actions as acting within the lines of the law, however, failed to acknowledge the spirit of the law. Solutions to the continuous problem of income smoothing needs to be individual-based. Although collectively, a highly ethical culture environment can support individuals in making ethical decisions, increasing ethical awareness and moral virtues of individuals through education and workshops will help individuals learn to assess ethical situations more thoroughly, acknowledging all stakeholders involved. 
ask yourself five questions. What benefits and harms does income smoothing produce? The SEC expects a public company to report truthful information in all of its filings with the Commission. The accounting profession is harmed when an audit does not obtain sufficient, competent evidence judged with professional skepticism and objectivity without partiality to one set of stakeholders. 2. What moral rights do affected parties have? The rights theory illustrates that investors have the right to know the true performance of the company since their potential, if not already stakeholders, basing their investments on the number percentage. Intentional misstatement of financials violates that categorical imperative. Number three, which course of action treats everyone the same? Using justice theory is to support the rights of stakeholders and add equality and fairness to the answer. Due to management's indiscretion with income smoothing, stakeholders' interest declines significantly and management views narrow. Kohlberg was working on stage six called Universal Ethical Principles, in which he cites justice and equality as examples of principles that are deemed universal. Which course of action advances the common good? Act Utilitarian acknowledges that sometimes there are two right answers to a problem. It requires that the act that creates the greatest good for the greatest number of stakeholders should be selected. Which course of action develops moral virtues? Using virtue theory, honesty requires that the statement should be truthful and recognize revenue using generally accepted accounting principles. Trustworthiness means that the accountants should not violate the investor's faith that the statements are accurate and reliable. GAAP allows the susceptibility of earnings management from a materiality perspective. However, materiality is based on management's judgment, which results in management of earnings that distorts the application of GAAP, thereby questioning the quality of earnings. Financial shenanigans involves income smoothing schemes of over or understating revenues and profits. It is unethical to use such tactics if they distort the real financial health of the company. Several opportunities motivated Sendent to engage in income smoothing practices. Egoism and playing the numbers game pressured management to fraudulently manage company earnings. The lack of proper corporate governance and internal controls, as well as auditors failing to perform due diligence, contributed to the opportunity to carry on the fraud. Donald R. Cressy a criminologist, is credited with coming up with the concept of the fraud triangle. The first component of the fraud triangle is motivation to commit the fraud, which can be attributed to incentives or pressures as visually shown on the top point of the triangle. The second component of the fraud triangle consists of uh, the opportunity to commit the fraud, which is denoted by the left point of the triangle. Finally, the third component of the fraud triangle consists of the involved parties to rationalize the purpose of committing the fraud. Now that we know the components of the fraud triangle, let's see the components as they relate to Cook from the case study. As mentioned from the previous slide, the first component of the fraud triangle is composed of motivation to commit the fraud in the form of incentives or pressures. For Cook, the company was motivated to commit the fraud because they always wanted to meet the financial results that were anticipated by the Wall Street analysts. This induced them to manipulate earnings via methods that was not endorsed by GAAP. The second component of the fraud triangle consists of the opportunity to commit the fraud. For the company Cook, they had the opportunity to commit the fraud because they represented senior management personnel of the company. This meant they had the authority to override internal controls and inflate earnings through unethical means without anybody able to stop them. In addition, this meant that the tone at the very top levels of executive management allowed for unethical and fraudulent behavior to influence the company culture. 
This can be seen in a case as middle to lower level personnel did not challenge the unethical accounting practices that upper management delegated for the workers to do. This gives us insight that from an ethical dissonance model, this company consists of low organizational ethics formed together with low individual employee ethics, a low, low situation that creates a culture of corruption where employees do not stop to question their leaders. The final component of the fraud triangle consists of Cook Company rationalizing that this behavior is acceptable because it allows them to entice an honest company to merge with them and become a larger company. In addition, the merger will allow for the fraudulent behavior to continue. The merger equated to the ability of larger fraudulent reserves that can increase the earnings and projections needed to meet an analyst of Wall Street. We now take a look at management from the perspective of the fraud triangle. For component one of the triangle, management had incentives to commit fraud because they will profit from increased employee stock options from selling of inflated common stock prices for their company. From component two, management had the opportunity to commit the fraud because they control all personnel in the company and thus are able to make changes to accounting entries or schedules whenever they needed. In addition, the auditors they work with lack professional skepticism in their auditing standards. Lastly, from component three, management can rationalize performing this fraud because they want to do anything possible to look good on Wall Street to meet quarterly and annual forecasts of their company. Okay, I was tasked with determining the role of professional judgment in the audits by EY and if EY met its ethical obligations under the AICPA code. So I thought it was best to introduce the basic bare bones concepts behind professional judgment and the AICPA code since I only have a few minutes here to get my point across. Uh, the these are the basic principles and guidelines that should lead professional auditors into making the best rational conclusion when performing audits. Um, the KPMG professional judgment framework states that judgment is the process of reaching a decision or drawing a conclusion where there are a number of possible alternative solutions. Um, auditors should always exercise professional skepticism, which is a large part of professional judgment in which they should always be skeptical of any evidence provided uh, during an audit and also investigate that evidence further to possibly come across any other evidence that contradicts the documents that were provided. Um, they should also clarify issues and objectives, consider alternatives, gather and evaluate information, reach a conclusion, articulate, and document rationale. That's just a basic five-step process of performing an audit. Um, as far as the AICPA code, um, the basic concept is that the overriding responsibility of CPAs is to exercise sensitive professional and moral judgments in all activities. Um, and the basic AICPA principles laid out in the text are responsibilities, the public interest, integrity, objectivity, and independence, due care, scope, and nature of services. So did EYA execute proper for professional judgment and adhere to the AICPA code? Well, I decided to pull a few quotes from the case to get my point across in my limited time. So Kendon concealed its fraudulent scheme to EY, and EY was aware of numerous practices by Coog and Kendon indicating that the financial statements did not conform to GAAP. Now they were they were aware of the indicators, but they decided um, consciously to not investigate further. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, for example, Cook and Kennett provided EY with contradictory drafts of schedules when EY requested support for the establishment of the Kennett Reserve. The schedules were inconsistent with regard to the nature and amount of the individual components of the reserve. I believe a big mistake that was made on behalf of the EY auditors um, was when they were provided the documents from Kendon and failing to dive deeper into the information provided 
um, despite the clear indicators that a reasonable, reasonable professional should have picked up on. Um, the auditors excessively relied on management rep representations concerning the appropriateness of the reserves and performed little substantive testing despite the evidence that the reserves were established and utilized improperly. Um, despite this, EY did not obtain adequate analysis, documentation, or support for changes that they observed in the various revisions of the schedules submitted to support the establishment of the reserves. This here to me was a clear breach of professional skepticism because they just took the documents as truth without exercising the professional duty and really investigating any further, which is the exact opposite of professional skepticism, which is stressed so heavily. So in conclusion, um, it is clear that UI did not meet their ethical obligations under the AICPA code. The second principle of the AICPA code stresses that clients, credit grantors, governments, employers, investors, the business and financial community, and others who rely on the objectivity and integrity of CPAs to maintain the orderly functioning of commerce should be considered when performing an audit. EY's auditors failed to detect the fraud because they did not execute due care and professional skepticism, which is a clear violation of the AICPA code of professional conduct. Um, Kenan's improper reversal of merger and acquisition related restructuring reserves resulted in an overstatement of operating income by $217 million. This will obviously have a significant effect on the general economy and the stakeholders in this case, and this could have been prevented if the auditors did their due diligence. Now let's jump into the next topic and explain why and how trust broke down on the Senate case, including shortcomings in corporate governance. The audit-client relationship is based on trust. Merriam-Webster defines trust as assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. Trust broke down when sentence management provided false representations of gap conformity, internal controls, and stating that all financial information had been provided to EY. Senate was also backdating accounting entries and withholding financial information and schedules to ensure that EY would not detect the company's accounting fraud. Senate also went as far to provide EY with various schedules regarding the Senate reserves that were falsified. This will be discussed more in depth in the upcoming slides. There are three key parts to Senate's corporate governance that led to its shortcomings. These include management, internal controls, and the auditors. Though this is not an exhaustive list as to what defines corporate governance, we believe that these are the keys to the shortcomings within Sendit. Corporate governance can be defined as giving overall direction to the enterprise with overseeing and controlling the executive actions of management, and with satisfying legitimate expectations of accountability and regulation by interests beyond the corporate boundaries. As I go into the corporate governance of management, it will also lead into internal controls as these two keys are intertwined. According to Mintz and Morris, management has a relationship with the corporation and its shareholders that is one of trust and confidence. The standard of due care provides that they are to act in good faith and act in a way that is in the best interests of the corporation. As stated earlier, management would create accounting entries with backdates, but they would also force lower level employees to create fictitious entries to go along with the fraud. This tone at the top speaks volumes to lower level employees, which created a greedy corporate environment. Moving on to internal controls, Walter Forbes and Kirk Shelton failed to oversee the creation of an accounting control environment. According to the statements in the SEC's investigation, Cook managers falsified the company's books and records and failed to implement a system of internal accounting controls. They went on to state that the company intentionally failed to devise and maintain an adequate system of internal accounting controls. Upper management essentially made whatever accounting entries were needed to be made to continue the fraud. As I reference back to key players, one of the noteworthy points listed in the text regarding corporate governance structures is that there should be a separation of duties between the CEO and board chair. Walter Forbes not only held the chair of the board of directors for Cook, he was also the CEO of the company as well. This week in sentence governance structure. As I move to the last key point of sentence shortcomings of corporate governance, 
There are two points that drive home how EY did not fulfill their obligations set forth by the PCAOB. The text states that there are required communications between the auditors and the audit committee. One is on matters relating to the company's account policies. The other is regarding the estimates made by management and the process used to develop those estimates, including significant changes to the process, reason for the changes, and the effects on the financial statements. As mentioned earlier, management provided EY with various schedules for the Ascendant Reserve. EY failed to perform extensive substantive testing in the significant account, as well as many others noted by the SEC investigation. It was noted that the schedules were inconsistent with regard to the nature and amount of the individual components of the reserve. EY failed in their obligation to the public interest that underlies their corporate governance responsibilities. It was also noted by Ron Rimkus that the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization did not reconcile with its reported cash balances, which suggests that the auditors failed to verify the cash balances at Cook's banks. He went on to say that this is a rudimentary function of auditing. To conclude, not only did management and internal controls fail in sentence governance, giving way to the auditor-client trust, the auditors did not fulfill their obligations either. Ron Rumkus said it best, Senate Corporation is the result of merging an ethical company with an unethical company.